G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy as the AFL off season wears on. I can't believe it's only just started. It feels like it's been going forever. Uh, but today, as part of this off season content series, I'm going to be taking a look at players around the league and ranking them by their trade value or their perceived trade value. So uh, this one is kind of nuanced. Obviously, it's very different to ranking players uh, based on their, their overall quality. When it comes to trying to evaluate someone's trade value, there's a lot of factors that are involved in that. Um, and generally speaking, I've assembled like 20 players here. The premise of, of the ranking is uh, trying to rank them by what would be the, the cost of trying to prize them free of their current existing club. Now, plotting someone's true trade value is, is a very hypothetical scenario because if it was a real life trade scenario, there'd be factors such as, you know, a given player's contract status. You know, if he's got five years left on a deal or if he's got one year or if he's out of contract, that would be a factor there. Um, the club that he's going to, what kind of draft picks do they have? In this video, I'm trying to look past that, ignore factors that may um, be inhibiting a player's value in, in real life scenarios. This is a hypothetical trade value, and it's more or less based on a player's ability, obviously, but also it's kind of like a, an ability to potential to how many years left they've got uh, ratio. So players that are sort of deep into their prime won't actually have the same trade value as someone perhaps just hitting their prime now, if that makes sense. So the, the rankings that I've assembled are a little bit biased against players who are good and have been good for a while. And it's biased towards players that are starting to show some potential, um, but are potentially playing at a high level already, but also have, you know, up to 10 years left of their, their their career left. And it's also, to be honest, going to be a little bit biased towards key position players uh, because generally trade value kind of works that way. There's a bit of a premium on particularly key position forwards. Uh, and so if you've got a player that's a key position forward right at the start of his prime, he's gonna have a really high trade value as opposed to a midfielder, generally speaking. It'll make more sense, hopefully, as I get into the rankings. So again, to reiterate, you know, a, a player's true trade value is different to what would actually happen in a trade scenario. A player probably very rarely gets traded for what they're actually worth. Uh, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, usually because contracts are a huge uh, factor in that, as are, you know, the position of the team that's recruiting him. So for instance, we'll use the, the Tim Kelly trade um, as an example. West Coast was a good team when they recruited Tim Kelly, so they had to offer, you know, two late firsts and two late seconds. By contrast, had he requested a trade to the Gold Coast Suns that year, who probably held pick one, probably, yeah, it was Gold Coast, uh, he probably would have been traded for pick one, potentially. So I'm just going to get into the video. Uh, before I do, if you could consider subscribing to the channel, that'd be much appreciated. I'm trying to hit 25k by the end of the year. It's a really audacious goal. Um, if at the very least, it would be nice to start next season with 25k. But anyway, if you haven't subscribed and you would get something out of my content, please consider doing so. You'd be helping out the channel a lot. All right, let's get into it. I'm going to start with the most valuable player and then move to the 20th valuable player. Um, and I found uh, before I start, like the first six to 10 probably was somewhat straightforward or maybe not straightforward, but I felt confident in. Um, and then after that, it gets a lot, a lot more even, but I'll explain as I go. So who is the most valuable player in the league from a trade value perspective, a hypothetical trade value perspective? It's got to be Nick Dacos, I think. When you consider he's already a top level player, um, with high potential to get better as well, considering you know he, the more he moves into the midfield, the more impact he could potentially have. Uh, and the fact that he's 20, we're looking at a kid who's probably got like 12, potentially 14 years of AFL level service. He's already at a uh, level where if he was in his prime, you'd, you'd be like, damn, he's a good player. But you get the sense there's more to give there from Nick Dacos. So he's just a high level player already. Again, age is a factor. I'm not considering contract status or anything like that, just purely what would he be worth on a hypothetical open market. I think Nick Dacos, would be up there for one of the first players picked, to be honest. In second position, I am going to put the player that I think is the best player in the competition in Marcus Bontempelli. Yes, he is 28, uh, but you factor in, in my opinion, he's the clear, clear best player in the competition. And uh, you, you feel like with his profile, he could probably play for another five or six years. And to different clubs, again, he will be valued differently. So, you know, the West Coast Eagles probably wouldn't be willing to part ways with pick one for Marcus Bontempelli because it doesn't make sense for their for their list move. But, you know, someone uh, like a St. Kilda who's probably looking to break into the top four, uh, then relatively speaking, they'd be able to offer more. But I think Bontempelli still, because he can probably still play into his mid-30s, and potentially transition into as a forward, I think he still has at least top two trade value in the competition. Then we'll talk about Charlie Kerno as the third most. Again, it's just a little bit biased towards key forwards, and he's probably the best one that's sort of hitting his prime. He has won the common two years in a row, so you could easily say he is actually the best 
uh, key forward in the game. Uh, someone like a Jeremy Cameron won't feature high on this list because he's 30 years old. Okay, just to put that out there. Charlie Curnow is still 26 and probably has a good six years of his prime left. Um, I'm not sure how long he'll play for, but that's my logic. He's still got a long time left. Similarly, a player that's even younger and a key position back, I've actually put Sam Taylor higher on this list than I had expected. He was all Australian already, I think at the age of 22, and it's just a really high level key defender. And when you factor in 24 years of age, uh, he's got a long career left. He could probably do what he's doing for another eight years uh, before you know reassessing where that's at. But because he's got so much of his best football ahead of him, you'd think, I think Sam Taylor would probably ranks number four. And then I've got a bunch of 2018 draft midfielders that I found a little bit difficult to separate. And again, it's not just ranking them on quality, it's probably trade value, but I'll just say them all in one hit because it's pretty tight. In Sam Walsh, Zach Butters, and Connor Rosie, all three of these have a profile. Who's the best player of the three? Right now, it's Zach Butters, I would say. But Sam Walsh does have that, you just get the sense that he's going to be a you know perennial Brownlow contender. Uh, now that he's uh, well, he, now he's playing a full season. Obviously, player of the final series. Zach Butters was the MVP this year, and Rosie arguably has the the highest ceiling of them all because of his ability to, to play as a dynamic forward as well. But of those three, it's pretty tight. They're all 23 year old midfielders, uh, and their best is still all ahead of them for sure. Um, so yeah, outstanding bunch of players there. Next, I'm going to go Luke Jackson. Again, this is obviously hypothetical because he's already been traded. And he got traded for two first round picks. One of them was, uh, I think, pick 13. The second one became pick six or whatever, and a second rounder. So um, again, like as far as young, talented, key position players go, Luke Jackson would be one of the most valuable, but considering he's only 22. And I would argue he had a pretty good first season at Fremantle. The question mark for him is always like role, where does he fit in? But he kicked 20 plus goals as like a forward ruck midfielder. And um, I'm not necessarily saying he projects to be one of the best players in the competition, but in terms of value, I think you know key position players are worth their weight in gold, and he is looking like a very good one. Speaking of, I'll move to two key position players that were hard to split, both from an appearance point of view, and also, um, well, kind of their names as well, but also in value, Max King and Ben King. I've just got the next two. I just slotted Max King higher than Ben because I think Ben's had the more recent ACL, so uh, there you go. But two really high level key forward prospects that are again are only 23. So I've put them higher than some of the other types, like there's Norton, there's Oscar Allen, there is Nick Larkey. They're, they're younger than both, but also they're taller than both, or all three rather. Um, and I think the potential there is is probably the highest for those King twins. And there's also injury that's been a factor. Ben King kicked 40 goals this year from 20 games. I think Max kicked 28 from 11. So their goal per game average is still on a par and they're younger and they've been battling through injuries to a greater extent. So for me, I think the trade value of those kids, kids, well, they're kids to me, uh, is, is still really, really high, but I can see why people disagree with that. Then you go with the breakout star of 2023 uh, in Errol Goulden, who uh, is only 21 years of age and became a, a bit of a sensation this year in the fact that he got closer to the brown load that people expected, but he was also a uh, all Australian wingman won heaps of the ball, uh, probably the most improved player in the competition this year. And the fact that he's only 21 as a midfielder uh, shows that we're probably looking at another 12 years of this guy potentially in his prime. Like if this is already his output, there's a long way to go yet. So again, I've, I've only slotted him behind some of those key position players because I did, as I did explain, there's going to be a bias towards key position players. But uh, as far as a midfielder goes, he's very, very talented. And we'll move on to one that's also very talented from the same state in Tom Green, who is 22 years old. I think he was the most, uh, had the most possessions per game of any player this year. And at 22, that is outstanding. Absolute competitor, really high level talent. You feel like another potential Brownlow contender. I don't think he's shown as much to be a, as safe a bet as guys like Walsh and Rosie and Butters and to some extent as well Goulden. Goulden probably actually outperformed him this year, but Tom Green is still one of the most valued midfield young prospects in the competition. Now we're going to get to two teenagers, and this is contentious because there's a few players I've still left off this list, uh, but it is very hard. But um, I'm going to slot the rising star in Harry Shearsall here, and then the guy who may or may not have won it had he played a full season in Will Ashcroft. As an aside as well, I should have said I'm not including any players that haven't played a game yet. If you include Harley Reid in this list, he probably does belong on the list purely because what we saw, clubs were already trying to trade for him. But for simplicity, I thought, uh, leave out the 2023 draftees. But Sheasel is was the rising star winner and Will Ashcroft looks like, again, could be a high, a high production player throughout his entire career. Like both of these guys had a massive impact 
or a good impact on their respective clubs. She's won the best and fairest at 19. Sensational talents, and I think with so much of their best football still ahead of them, these guys, I do think, would fetch more in a trade than, say, Christian Petrarca, who I have next. And Petrarca, what did I have him as the second or third best player in the comp? I think I had him as the third best player in the comp. Um, he's 28 years old, but still, again, five or six years left, considering he could probably transition to more of a like a power forward later in his career, like we've seen with Dustin Martin. Hello, everyone. I'm going to do the unorthodox method of editing what I say in the video after I've already recorded it. As I started filming, uh, editing this video, rather, I started thinking, why did I have Petrarca so low? And uh, then it like further occurred to me that Petrarca, I, I messed up his age, he's actually a year younger than Bond. So I don't think I could justify having Petrarca as low as I did in this video. So I'm actually gonna move him up right now. I'm gonna change it on the screen and move him up to a, like around that Butters Rosie Walsh level, maybe just below, just cause he's a little bit older, he's 27. Um, but yeah, that was weird. And I would just like to correct that before I finish editing the video. Then we've got four players left on this list. I've gone with Jacob Wiedering. Uh, again, another high quality key position back. Uh, I think he made the All-Australian squad this year. Don't think he made All-Australian, did he? Uh, but 26 years old, former number one draft pick and uh, looks to be an absolute, um, obviously a mainstay there at Carlton. And part of what I think is an amazing spine there where I've included Sam Walsh in this video. I've included Charlie Kerno. Jacob Wiedering has the potential to be a real premier key back of the competition and a bit younger than some of the other players that I've left out of this video. Then I'm gonna actually slot in Jordan Dawson here, purely because he's still only 26 and had a massive breakout year this year for the Adelaide Crows and uh, very, very uh, impactful sort of outside mid who can really cut teams up with his ball use. And I think, uh, you know, with his ascension to being a top line midfielder this year, it is only early days. Like he's probably had one season where he's been a top liner. Every other year he's probably been just a high potential player. Uh, but Jordan Dawson, I think, does slot into this purely because of the age and leadership um, aspect of it as well. Then a couple of ones in Jamara Yugo Hagen, a former number one draft pick, only 21 years old. Again, this one's on more potential and bias towards key position forwards in particular. But 35 goals this year, I think we've seen glimpses of his promise. And I think you'd be comfortable banking on him at this stage. So if you're a respective club who is uh, trying to look for a key forward, Jamara's out of contract this year. And I suppose it'll be remains to be seen, like what kind of offers come the Bulldogs way if that does eventuate. But I think um, he ticks all the boxes, high potential, shown enough with 35 goals this year, only 21, key position forward, form one, number one draft pick. I think he easily makes this list. And then this is tough. I've missed, missed out a few players here, but I'm actually gonna go Caleb Sarong here as a 22-year-old mid, because I think what he's doing for his age is actually phenomenal. Uh, All-Australian midfielder this year, you feel like a real brown low chance in the coming years. Again, leadership uh, qualities as well. I think uh, the age to potential to talent ratio there is, uh, is right there with Caleb Sarong. So again, this is where it kind of gets even. There's a bunch of players that I've missed out. Um, you know, there's a couple of like key backs in their prime, Harris Andrews and Darcy Moore. Uh, you know, Josh Dacos is around the mark for this list. Tim English as well. A couple of key forwards that are unlucky. Oscar Allen and Aaron Norton, I think, were two, and Nick Larkey are three players there who I think would fetch a very hefty trade price, but I just couldn't quite squeeze them into this list. Um, obviously, there's Lockie Neal and Toby Green. Both of these guys are 30. And therefore, if a trade happened tomorrow, you know, they could probably get away with picks, you know, potentially around about pick 10. Whereas, you know, you contrast with some of these other players, I think if, you know, Nick Dacos, in terms of his trade value, would probably be two top five picks. Um, so if that makes sense. So I buy, I've been biased against the older experienced players. I've been biased towards key position players, a little bit biased towards key forwards in particular. And if you're just a high quality midfielder, you're probably not gonna find your way into this list. But again, I, I missed out heaps of players of all different types, if that makes sense. So this is all very hard to do. It's quite arbitrary, but I hope I've put forward something that gets people thinking. And we're all gonna have different opinions on this. So by all means, let me know in the comments uh, what you would do differently and how you would judge trade value. Because again, I kind of just plucked this topic, but I thought it was fun. So again, thank you for watching guys. Thanks for your support this year. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you the next one. Cheers.